How many love Jesus? Raise your hand. What a joy and honor to be here. I can't tell you how much I love your pastor and his wife. You are blessed. Uh, when, when God was going to repopulate the world, he had to choose a man. And it says he searched the world and he chose Noah. Why? Because it said he was blameless. It wasn't perfect, he was blameless. Why? Because he walked with God. You couldn't have a, a better pastor and pastor's wife than Pastor Drew and Alicia. They are just incredible people. Uh, I, I told them as soon as I stop traveling every Sunday, this is going to be my home church uh, because I love them so much and I believe in what they're doing. And I am so humbled to be here. I have the opportunity of overseeing about now about 482 churches from Fresno down to the Mexican border, about 1,300 credentialed ministers. I get to speak in a different Assembly of God church every Sunday, but I really wanted to be here because I love this church. It's going to be 100 years old. Did you know that? Turn to your neighbor and say, you look pretty good for 99 years old. Tell them. And I believe that God still has his hand on this church, and it's a great church. And I, I am humbled because I come from humble beginnings. I, I was born in a place called Pacoima, California. How many have ever heard of Pacoima before? Anybody? How many have ever been to Pacoima? Anybody ever been? And you're still alive. Man, that is a miracle because Pacoima is a rough place. How rough? I'm glad you asked. Legend has it that these four guys were driving in Pacoima. Well, that's not true. You don't drive in Pacoima. You cruise in Pacoima. So they were cruising in Pacoima, and they took a turn a little bit too fast, car overturned, and they were killed. When they opened their eyes, they are standing in front of the pearly gates met by St. Peter. I did say this was a legend, didn't I? And uh, Peter says, uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? And they said, hey, we're from Pacoima. We like to come in. And Peter says, uh, we don't have anyone from Bacoima. I'm going to have to talk to the Lord about this. And so he goes and talks to Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, we don't have anyone from Bacoima up in heaven. Go get those four guys and bring them in. A few minutes later, Peter is running back to the Lord. <laughs> Lord, they're gone. He said, with the guys from Bacoima? No, the gates. <laughs> now you have to be from Bacoima to tell that story. And I am from Bacoima. And there in the San Fernando Valley, my grandpa pioneered one of the first Spanish-speaking Pentecostal churches in the San Fernando Valley. At the age of five years old, I gave my life to Jesus. Now, I don't know why I waited so long, but I said, at five years old, I'm going to get serious about this. And so I've served Jesus all my life. So today, I don't have a testimony on how to overcome drugs because I've never taken drugs. I can't tell you how to be delivered from alcohol because I never... Well, that's not true. Every once in a while, I take a shot of NyQuil. We call that Pentecostal whiskey in our house. But that's like the strongest drink I've ever had. Never got in trouble with the law. And you say, well, what can you tell me? I can say this, that the promises of God are real. That the saving power of Jesus can keep you all the days of your life. And thank God that I was impacted by this godly man, my grandpa, who became my hero. That since a little boy, I said, I want to be like that man. I want to know God the way he knows them. I want to serve Jesus the way he served Jesus. And that's why I'm so humbled to be here and to be a part of this great family we call the Assemblies of God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, we belong to a big family. Will you tell him that? We belong to a big family. You might say, I know, Pastor, I didn't get any breakfast this morning. My family's too big. No, no. You belong to what is called the Assemblies of God. Just think that in 1914, 300 people gathered in Hot Springs, Arkansas because they had been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they said this, we can do more together than we can do individually. We can, we can raise up more ministers, we can plant more churches, we can do more for missions. And from 1914, those 300 today, today number 70 million around the world that attend Assembly of God churches. Our missionaries tell us every 41 seconds someone is giving their life to Jesus in an Assembly of God church. And you're responsible for that because you support missions, because you pray for missionaries. This is a, one of the historic missions church in Southern California. You're sitting in it right now. And because of that, God is moving. In the 1950s, there were 5,000 Assembly of God attenders in Latin America. 
Today, there are over 25 million people that attend Assembly God Church in Latin America. God is pouring out His Spirit like never before. I just returned from the Middle East. I've been there now two times on my way back for a third visit, and God is pouring out His Spirit. We've seen over 20,000 Muslims come to Christ because of the refugee crisis that is happening today. God is doing some amazing things. That's the good news. The bad news is, of that 70 million, 67 million live overseas, and less than 3 million live in the United States. They say that the United States of America is the third most lost nation in the world behind China and India. How can that be? A nation that God has blessed, that sent missionaries around the world. In 1950s, there were more assembly got of members in the United States and all the world. And now it's completely reversed. As I said, I speak for a living in a different church every Sunday. And I get there early like I did today. And I like to drive around, get a feel of the community. This is my backyard. I know this community real well. I want to see, you know, where your Starbucks is. And if you have my wife's a favorite restaurant. Matter of fact, my wife, my prime rib of 41 years, wanted to be here today. But how many know when they need grandma, grandpa is second? How many grandpas can say amen to that? But uh, her favorite restaurant's in and out burger. I didn't find it. I know it's around here somewhere. But as I drive around, and I know you do as well, you find church after church after church. There's Christian radio, Christian television. How can America be so lost? Is that, that most of those churches are empty now. They estimate that this year alone, there'll be 4,000 new churches that will start, but 7,000 churches will close their doors this year. How many believe Orange County First Assembly will one day no longer be a church, and it'll be a, some kind of apartment complex, but it won't be? How many believe that? You don't believe that, do you? Neither of those 7,000 churches didn't believe that. The churches that were historic churches in our movement are no longer churches. They're no longer there. What happened? Everywhere I go, every church says they're a church for the community. Matter of fact, I read your bulletin where it says Christ, cause, and community. You believe this is a church for the community, don't you? So do these churches. But what's happened is that they've stopped being a church for the community. I did a little research Within a five-mile radius, just five miles around this church, I used to jog all the time. Now I, I kind of bike, and I have to do something. When you eat out every meal, you got to do something, right, Pastor Drew? Come on, raise up that chubby little hand with me, you know? You just got to work out. With well, a five-mile radius around this church, just five miles around this church, there lives 654,935 people, almost 650,000 people live five miles around this church. Just think about it. And of those 650,000, statistics tell us only 20% say they go to church. Now, they might show up for Christmas and Easter, but they think they're churchgoers. I had a man in my church said, Pastor, every time I come to church, you preach the same message. I said, because you only come at Christmas time, that's why. <laughs> if you came another time, you'd hear another message. But he thinks he's a churchgoer. So 20%... Of that 650,000, say they go to church. 20% of that 650,000 have stopped coming to church. How many know people that used to come to church that no longer come to church? Come on, you know someone. They got their feelings hurt. You know, someone said something. We're a bunch of hypocrites, whatever. Had a lady in my church say, Pastor, every time I come to church, this lady gives me a dirty look. I said, what? Oh, yeah, she gives me a dirty look. I said, sister, that's just the way she looks. But everyone has an excuse why they stopped coming. So 20% say they go to church. 20% have stopped coming to church. But listen to me, 60% of that 650,000 people that just live five miles around this church have never been to church a day in their life. They weren't raised by Christian parents or grandparents like many of us were. And that's not that they don't believe in God, but the number one reason, and we saw it in the video today with Mike, is that no one has ever invited me to church. You heard Pastor Drew. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many of you invited people to church, but I know we don't. And well, Pastor, you understand, I got problems. Oh, Pastor, you only knew my problems. You got problems, I got problems. All God's children have problems. 
But the reality is our name is written in the book of life. But what about those 650,000 people? See, the great churches of America, now listen to me, isn't because they have great buildings. Some of them don't even own a building. Isn't because they have great budget. Some of them have no budget. It's not because they have great pastors. I know some of these guys are not that great, some of them. I'll just be honest with you. The great church of America are great because they're made up of great people. People who love God, who love their church, who love their pastor, and who love their community. I believe this is a church that wants to love its community. And yet there are people that are lost around us. What are we going to do about it? I, a couple of years ago, I was preaching at a network conference meeting, and in the middle of my message, the Holy Spirit speaks to me right in the middle of my message. I said, you know, can you wait till I'm done, Lord, you know? And he says, so you have a burden for Muslims, do you? And I said, yes, Lord. I had seen the pictures of those boat people that were trying to escape into, uh, uh, out of Iraq and Iran and Syria and that you found him on the shores of Greece. There was even a picture of a little boy who had drowned on the shore, and I was moved by it. And I said, yes, Lord. And the, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. So you have a burden for Muslims? You don't even know a Muslim. And he was right. I didn't. And so the next thing, I find myself in the middle of a refugee camp in Lebanon. There are 1.5 million Syrian refugees that are now living in Lebanon in refugee camps. A million and a half. Now there are more Syrian children in Lebanon than Lebanese children. And most of these refugee camps, they're made up of single women and their children because their husbands were killed in the Syrian war. And they're there just barely surviving. And the day that we got there, they had moved from being, having... A, 30 liters of water a day to 15 liters of water a day per family. And I'm standing in the middle of that. And God says, this is what a Muslim looks like. See, we can have a burden, but if you don't know the people around you, if you don't have a burden for people around we can pray. And I believe in prayer, man. I, I believe in revival. But if you want to be a church for the community, it goes far beyond. It has, you have to say, I know people that are lost because the Holy Spirit said, and what are you going to do about it? I was in West Africa where the children were dying because of impure water. And today we have given now water filters through 800 villages in, in Lebanon and Sierra Leone. They say, but the year 2020, because of our efforts, we will eradicate child-born diseases from the border to border in the country of Lebanon because someone said, we've got to do something about it. We can do something about the lostness of Santa Ana if you will be a church for the community. Our story today simply portrays what God is calling us to do, and it's found in Luke 13, starting with verse 10. It says, on Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Notice these words. You might want to circle them. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your affirmities. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. What a great story. You know, Jesus, and, and I know Pastor Derek, my historian friend, would tell you that Jesus at the height of his popularity here in the story. Matter of fact, they were following him. Remember when he fed the 5,000? It wasn't 5,000. There were probably 20,000. They were just counting men. And these, uh, these Hebrew men were like Mexican men. They probably had a dozen kids, you know. Uh, and they were following him. They could get fed, they were being healed, they were following. And when there was a synagogue in a village, he would speak in the synagogue. And I have had the joy of being in Israel, and the synagogues aren't bigger than this building. They're from, this would be a big synagogue there. And, and just imagine thousands of people in the synagogue, they're following Jesus. And, and he tells us to be a church for the community, you have to, number one, be willing to see people around you. 
because we see one of the greatest miracles recorded in all the Bible where it says that he saw the woman. How could he see her? Now, in the synagogue, there were no chairs. So if we were going to be biblical, we'd have to take all the benches out, except for the teacher. He would sit. Everyone would stand. So I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and teach you for two hours, and you're going to stand and listen to me. <laughs> no, relax. We're not going to do that. But I want to demonstrate the, the miracle here that everyone's standing, crammed in this room. Jesus is teaching, and he saw the woman. How could he see her? She is bent double in a crowded room. I'm here to tell you today, there's seven billion people on this planet, and Jesus still sees you. He sees your tears. He hears your prayer. He sees you. You might not think so, but Jesus sees you. My question is, do you see the people? I drove around, I got here early, and I wondered, as I was driving down this main street, and I saw some man with a grocery cart, with all his worldly belongings in that car, probably slept in the park, I wonder if anybody sees him. See, we can get so numb of all the evil and corruption around us that we stop seeing people that are hurting and lost. He saw her. Jesus, wherever he went, he stopped and he saw people. And Matthew 9.36 says, And when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Dave and Allie have a little beautiful little baby there. I read recently for a baby to be healthy doesn't just need to have a clean diaper and be fed by mommy, but it needs what psychologists call attunement. Attunement is for a child to look up and see a loving face. Without that loving face looking back down at an infant, it will not grow healthy. The Bible says in Luke 6, 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Aren't you glad that when we blow it, God doesn't turn his face from us, but he turns towards us? My question is, are you seeing the people? I used to tell my people, I want you to invite your unsaved friends to church. And they would say, Pastor, we don't know any unsaved people. I said, what? Well, yeah, we don't. I said, you don't know any unsaved people? They go to work with you. They go to school with you. They live across the street from you. Some of them live in the same house you live in. But you don't know them because you don't see them. We can pray. But unless you know who you're praying for, you can't be a church for the community. But secondly, not only you've got to see people around you. Our story tells us you've got to take a risk with the people around you. You've got to take a risk. Now, just think about this story one, just one more moment. This woman, who it says was kind of possessed by an evil spirit for 18 years, comes into the synagogue. <laughs> now, I don't know how many demon-possessed people are here today. If, if you're here today, you know, Pastor Derek is going to exercise you after the service to see him. What a risk. A woman possessed coming to the synagogue, and Jesus takes a risk. In the middle of his message, he calls her out and has her come forward. What a risk. She could have said, no, no, Lord. I kind of like my condition. I've been like this for 18 years. I can see all the loose change and people drop on the ground. Uh, but look what happens when we take a risk for God. That something miraculous can happen. That she took a risk. Jesus took a risk. And bam, the miraculous happens. But pastor, we've always done church this way. We've always done this. We've always... Well, maybe that's the problem. Maybe we need to start taking some risk. 
maybe we've got to do something a little bit differently here. I mean, I, I'm a product of the church, and I love the church, and I'm, I'm a product of the tradition of the church. But friends, there are people lost around us. And if that means we have to give Egg McMuffins away for every Sunday to get unsaved people here, let's do it. Let's take some risks. We've got to be willing to take risks. And I know that's the hardest thing. It's no secret to grow a great church. The secret is this. The people that are here are willing to give up what they like in order to reach people who aren't here yet. But how many know the longer we're a Christ follower, the more selfish we could be? Now, let's be honest. There are people around us that, like I said, it's not that they don't believe in God. They just don't feel welcome. They don't feel like they'll be accepted. They don't feel like there's a place for them. And they're hungry. I've never had anyone that I've ever stopped who I said, is there something that I can pray for you about? Tell me, no, no, please don't pray for me. I don't believe in prayer. They're just waiting for someone to take a risk. Well, I know what you're saying, oh, Pastor. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't know my wife, Pastor. Don't look at her. Look at me, Pastor. You don't know my wife, Pastor. Man, she's a witch, Pastor. You know, man. Man, she has a broom. She flies around the, around the living room every night. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. And maybe you took a risk and you invited from, I told Pastor, I, I invited my boss to, a, to an Easter musical one time. And, oh, man, he barked at me like a dog. I mean, he, he I, I took a risk and... And oh, it was horrible. Notice what Matthew 5, 46 says. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? In other words, you've got to keep taking risks with people who have hurt you. Maybe it's an ex-spouse or a parent or an other believer or a former pastor. you got to keep taking risks even though sometimes it hurts. Now, I don't know if it's here in Santa Ana. It's not, you know, where I used to pastor, or they used to have trash can policemen. Now, I don't know if they have them here. And uh, they, they, they don't have them in Irvine, praise God, but they used to have them where I used to live. And what they used to do, they used to put a warning citation on your trash can if it was too dirty. And it would be a warning that if you don't clean your trash can, you're going to be cited. It's a trash can, friend. Now, I'll be honest with you, I won't feel real spiritual about this at all. And so I remember t seeing it, getting, you know, taking it off, putting it in my pocket, getting the trash can, putting it in my front lawn, dragging my hose out, I'm washing. And I noticed my neighbor's trash can has a red tag on his. I'm thinking, this is great. Because he was a mean man. I'm telling you, he was a mean man. I tried, to, I tried to be friendly. You know, as a minister, we're supposed to try, even though we don't want to be. I tried to be nice. This guy always complained. He just always was griping. And I thought, you know, I'm going to put my tag on his barrel. He'll have two tags. And I was feeling real good about myself until the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, I want you to wash his can. I said, God, but he's a mean man. So I'm not, I'll be honest, I wasn't feeling real spiritual about this at all. So I took his tag, put it in my pocket, I washed it out, put his can back. He didn't even know he had a warning citation on his. But a week later, I'm putting my full can out. He's pulling his full can out. You know, like always, I kind of put on a fake smile and waved at him and said, Hi, how are you doing? And he says, I need to speak to you. I said, now what? He said this. My wife got some bad news from her doctor. Would you consider your church praying for her? You think that's coincidence? Or when you take a risk on people who are unlovable? See, every hand you'll shake today, Jesus died for that person. And all it takes for you is to take a risk. To say, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to reach out and I'm going to take a risk. You first got to see them. They're around you every day. You got to take a risk. Even as a church, we've got to start taking risks. 
Today, churches that are taking risks through cities serve are reaching communities like never before. You've got to take a risk. But thirdly, our story tells us you've got to reach out to people around you. Not only do you see them, not only do you take a risk, but you've got to reach out. Now, ladies, it's your turn. You look at me. Your husband can say he loves you, he loves you, he loves you, but if he doesn't take out the garbage, you question that love just a little bit. How many ladies can say amen, right? Right? Because love demands action, right? You can say you love people. Man, we can say we love people. I don't know, a church in America doesn't say that they don't love people. But are they reaching out? Now, let's think about this one more time. Jesus had 12 disciples. Well, matter of fact, he had 11. One guy flaked out on him, and then Paul joins him later. But these 12 disciples turned their world upside down. That the known world was almost evangelized. Half of Jerusalem were Christ's followers because of these 12 men. Now look around you. We got more than 12 people in this room. We got more than 12 people. All Santa Ana should be one to Jesus. But it's not because we're not all reaching out. Now, I used to pastor in the inner city of Las Vegas. How many have ever been to Las Vegas before? Anybody ever been to Las Vegas before? Anybody ever? Here? Shame on you. What are you doing in Las Vegas? <laughs> no, it was great. I, we loved it there. And, you know, you think it gets hot here. Ew, this is nothing compared to Vegas. It gets like 120 degrees in Vegas. Matter of fact, every summer they have a reporter on the news fry an egg on the sidewalk. I said, I ain't going to eat that egg. Why do you keep frying it on the sidewalk? <laughs> to show you how hot it is. And I used to feel so sorry for people who hitchhike in Vegas. I got my Teen Challenge friends here today. How many of you ever hitchhiked before? Come on, raise your hand, right? I mean, I, I would feel so sorry for guys like you. You know, I'd always feel sorry. It's at 120 degrees there, them hitchhiking. I'd say, come on, buddy, you need a ride, get in. And all the people I've given a ride to, not one of them offered to pay for my gas. Or make my car payment. Or pay for my insurance. But they sure enjoyed the ride. Now, if you're a visitor here, you're a hitchhiker. And you're just along for the ride. But what about the rest of us? That every Christian is a minister. And every ministry is important. Where are you reaching out? Where are you serving? This Thursday I hear is a volunteers. Everyone here should be there. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I used to serve. I used to teach. Man, I, I used to sing, but, but now I'm retired. What? Oh. I, I, pastor Drew, I looked up the Hebrew word for retirement in the Old Testament, and it's the word dead. <laughs> Abraham served. He died. You know, Moses served, he died. My grandpa preached until he was 87 years old. He went home, read his Bible, put his Bible on his chest, opened his eyes in the presence of God. One of my heroes here is Pastor Madala is here today. He's one of my heroes. He ain't retired. <laughs> Where do you serve? Where can you serve? Maybe you couldn't do the things you used to do, but you can still reach out. That's what it's going to take to win our communities for Jesus. The reality is in every church in America, regardless of its size, 20% do 80% of the work and 20% give 80% of the resources for that church to do the work and the other 80% are hitchhikers. You don't find that overseas. Our missionaries tell us they've never found a new convert who didn't witness their faith. Because they're so excited that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. <laughs> we got to reach out. I know some of you were hurt because I think the greatest factor of Christians not serving is because they've been hurt in the past. I had a lady come to me and she said, you know, I used to serve, but they didn't give me a badge. I said, what? Oh, they didn't give me a badge. I said, that yo, they didn't give me a badge. Notice what Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, 
forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You've got to forgive. What's hurting our churches isn't what's happening from the outside. It's what's happening in the inside. Without unity, the Holy Spirit cannot work. The miracle of Acts when the 120 got filled with the Holy Spirit, wasn't it that 120 people got filled with the Holy Spirit, that you get 120 people in one room and they could all agree on one thing. The power of unity brought revival to that community and around the world. But notice our story, that if he first sees the woman, which was miracle enough, and then he spoke to the woman. Now in our story, later on, he calls her a daughter of Abraham. Not only any Jews are here today. You come from a Jewish background. You come from Jewish ancestry, you know. Yeah, there you go. You know, you ate a kosher hot dog one time. Oh, oh. He calls her a daughter of Abraham. Why? Because for 18 years, she's known as the demon-possessed woman. How would you like to be known as, oh, yeah, there's the demon-possessed woman of Santa Ana right there. Yeah, you know, I want that. No, she's a, for 18 years, she's called the demon-possessed woman until she walks in the house of God and Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham. Some of you have been walking around cursed. It was a parent who said, you'll never amount to anything. It was an ex-spouse or maybe it was even a Christian leader and you've been walking around cursed all these years until you walk into the presence of God. Man, I grew up in a Spanish-speaking church and I don't speak Spanish. It's a miracle God could use my life. <laughs> but God saw something in me. And God sees something in you today. He spoke to the woman. And then it says, he touched the woman. Matter of fact, he calls her forward. She pushes her away. Why did he have to touch her? Couldn't he say, hey, you woman. Aisle 10, seat 2, you're healed. No, he makes her come up, and he actually touches her because I believe she had never experienced a loving touch in her life. I think about people who live in this community who have never experienced a loving touch in their whole life. They've been abused. They've been beaten. They're starving. For the church of Jesus Christ to reach out in a tangible way and touch them with the gospel of love. You've got to see people around you. You've got to take a risk with people around you. You've got to reach out. But as soon as you say, God, use my life, you can be sure, in, like our story, that you're going to be criticized by the people around you. You don't want to be criticized? Don't do anything for God. But as soon as you say, God, use my life, someone's going to criticize you. I celebrate 41 years of marriage and full-time ministry, and I've been criticized all my life. When I was a youth pastor, I was criticized. When I was a pastor, I was criticized. I was a presbyter, I was criticized. I was an executive presbyter, I was criticized. I was the assistant superintendent, I was criticized. Now I'm a superintendent. If you read my email, you would weep with all the criticism I get. You're going to be criticized when you say, God, use my life. But notice our story, Luke 13, verse 14, indignant because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, to, so come and be healed on those days, but not on the Sabbath. Let's just stop right there. Does that seem a little strange to you or what? That this synagogue ruler has like the greatest miracle in the history of his synagogue. He said, hey, 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 there'll be no healing in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Does that seem a little strange to you or what? It happens in our churches every Sunday. People come in hurting, broken. But they're not going to tell anybody because they're afraid they're going to be criticized. What if I come up this morning and give my life to Jesus? What are people going to think? What if I come up with my spouse and say, please pray for our marriage? If I come up, please pray for my daughter who's run away or my son who's on drugs. We're afraid to be criticized. Friends, you and I are going to stand before Jesus one day. We're not going to be able to blame it on anybody. We're not going to say, oh God, they criticized me. 
That's why I didn't serve. That's why I didn't give. That's why I didn't be the person. It's going to be too late. You're going to be criticized. You might as well get ready. But notice Jesus' response. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Jesus never called a sinner a hypocrite. He called religious people hypocrites. People were more concerned about ritual and tradition and the past than the needs of hurting people. Hear my heart. I don't know how much longer they'll let me serve in this position. But my prayer is, God, don't look upon the sons of God as a bunch of hypocrites. That we're surrounded by hurting lost people. And we did nothing about. What if those kind of people come to our church? God, give me everyone no one else wants. Should be our prayer. Because you're going to be criticized. But you're going to stand before Jesus and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And finally, you want to be a church for the community? You've got to be spontaneous for the people around you. You've got to be spontaneous. Historians tell us this is the last time Jesus would be in this village. He was on the way to the cross. He wasn't going to come back. This was the one shot this demon-possessed woman had to listen to Jesus. This was one shot. He wasn't coming back. She could have said, well, you know, I ain't going to go to the synagogue this Sunday. I hear Peter's coming next week, and I hear he has the shadow ministry. I'll come next week. She was her one shot. She heard that Jesus was coming. The one that had opened blind eyes and healed the lame and fed the hungry. And, and Jesus saw her. And he called her. And he reached out and he touched her. It's amazing we're spontaneous. We miss God's blessing every day because we're not spontaneous. Right? God tells us to do something. We say, Lord, not today. I'll do it tomorrow. I've had to come to this altar and repent many times because God told me to do something about the refugee crisis, about the children dying in West Africa. I said, God, don't send me to these places anymore because I feel like I've got to do something about it. He says, if you don't, someone else will. God's speaking to you. The question is, will you be spontaneous? Today, you can be forgiven of your sin. Today, you can be set free from the things that bind you. It doesn't have to be drugs or alcohol. It could be bitterness and unforgiveness. Today, you can have a new plan for your life. Jesus is in the house. The question is, will you be spontaneous? Maybe he's talking to you about serving. You're going to come to that class. And you say, Pastor Drew, I don't know what I can do, but I can do something. You know, I know how you feel. As I said, I... I don't feel worthy of standing up here. I remember as a small boy how much I loved my grandpa. He was my hero. When I was in Bible college, he passes away. And I get a call from my mom and dad saying, son, your grandpa has passed away. And he wants you to come and preach his funeral. I love my grandpa. I drove home thinking memories of my grandpa. And we're, standing, we're sitting around the dinner table with my family and aunts and uncles and telling stories about my grandpa. And my mom says, Son, you remind me so much of your grandpa. What a compliment. I said, was it, was it how I preach? She said, No, he was a great preacher. You're nothing like him. I said, is it how I love people? Oh, no, no, no. Your grandpa loved people. Man, they used to come to his house and line up on the porch. Then what do I remind you of? He says, you're stubborn. <laughs> like your grandpa was. Oh, and my grandpa was stubborn. Every Christmas time, he would gather people from the church and say, I want you to bring all your extra food and clothes and Bibles, I'm going to take them to Mexico. 
And they'd say, Pastor Guerra, we love you, but we forbid that you go to Mexico. He went every year. I don't know why they were wasting their time. He was stubborn. He said, we, we forbid you because every time you go to Mexico, you drink the water, you eat their food, and you almost die. But he was insistent. He was going. And at 10 years old, he took his grandson. Now my mom was scared to death because, as I said, I'm stubborn like my grandpa. She'd say, no, mijo, don't go over there. I'd go over there, right? And I was just, I've been stubborn all my life. Matter of fact, I've been called the most graciously stubborn person you will ever meet. I'm stubborn. I'm reaching people for Jesus. I'm stubborn. The time is running out. So she makes my father go with us. So my dad's driving. I'm sitting in, the, in his truck. My, my dad's driving. I'm there, my grandpa. We're driving into Mexico. Now we're on the road, and all of a sudden, when we're in Mexico, we go off the road into a dirt road. I said, Grandpa, there's nothing out here. A bunch of dirt and tumbleweeds. He said, mijo, we're almost there. We travel about another hour off the highway on the dirt road, we come over a hill into a valley, and into that valley is a sea of cardboard boxes. And out of these cardboard boxes come people running out. That was their home. And they were saying in Spanish, he's back. He said he would come back, and he's back. And they were running to the truck, not for the food or not for the clothes, but they knew they could hear about Jesus again. Now, my grandpa, knowing I don't speak Spanish, I think he learned English so he could speak to his grandson. He said, now, mijo, I'm going to put you in the back of the truck. And when they come up to the truck, you give them a bag of clothes and a bag of food. Can you do that? No problem, grandpa. I can do that. And so... They come up to the truck and I'm passing out these bags of clothes and bags of food and my grandpa's praying for people and, and uh, all of a sudden, a little Mexican boy about my age walks up to the truck with two little friends of his. But I notice it's in the middle of winter, it's Christmas time. He's got no shoes, just a t-shirt on and it's freezing. Matter of fact, it was so cold and my mom was afraid that I would get lost. That you know those hunter hats that have the fur and then you can pull them up over your ears when it gets cold. She bought, especially bought it red so that if I would wander off, you could see me for miles away. She was convinced, I'm gonna get lost. You don't look like a Mexican and you can't speak Spanish. I'll never see you again, she thought. And here he is, t-shirt, no shoes. And so I pick up a bag of clothes and I give it to him and I couldn't say these are for you in Spanish. But he says, no, 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 no. I said, but you need clothes. It's cold. No, no, no. I could see his t-shirt was ripped. And you could see his ribs exposed. He can't eat. So I pick up a bag of food. I said, friend, this is for you. He said, no, 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 no. I said, but you need food. Have you ever been in a situation you felt so helpless in your whole life? That's how I feel sometimes when I go to community after community. And seeing the lostness and hearing about the violence and the shootings and the abuse. And... I said, well, I, can't, I can't help. What can I do for you? And all along, as he's standing next to the truck, He's staring at my head. So I take off my hat. I look at my hat, I look at him, I look at my hat, I look at him, I look at my hat, I look at him. And I gave him my hat. He put that hat on, turned and walked down that dirt street, the proudest Mexican in all of Mexico. Two little buddies walking beside him. I turned around and my grandpa had seen the whole thing 
Now I knew why he risked his life. Every Christmas time, give what he had to people who had nothing. My friend, what will you give today? You give your time, you give your talents, you give your time. Most importantly, you give your life. That moment, I said, Lord, I never want to lose this feeling. Because there's a greater man that's looking down from heaven. His name is Jesus. And as I looked at my grandpa, he had this big smile on his face. And I can look up in heaven's balcony. And I pray that Jesus would smile on his face. Today you can put a smile on Jesus' face. That today you give your life to Jesus. That you'll ask him to set you free from what's binding you. Ask him for new purpose and meaning in your life. Today can be your day. This church can be the church of the community. Would you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, in just a moment, I'm going to ask people to stand. And like Jesus, ask this woman to come forward. I'm going to ask them to come forward. And I can just imagine as this woman who had been crippled for 18 years, limped forward. I can just imagine seeing her every step she took towards Jesus. She stood up a little straighter until he placed his hand on her and she straightened up and she, it says she left thanking and praising God. She left different than what she came in and today you can leave different than what you came in. Today you can leave thanking and praising God because you've been forgiven of your sin. You've been set free from the things that are binding you and you have new purpose and meaning in, in your life. And if that's you today, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand, raise up your hand. From the main floor to the balcony. Maybe it's help with your marriage. Maybe it's help with your children. You have loved ones. that need God today that you want to stand in the balance for them to use you, use me, even though I couldn't even communicate, and I gave what I had, thank God for today, that's all God asks, give what you have, most importantly, give your life to him, would you stand to your feet with me?